This is a story called The History of Bramley, Part 1. Bramley, Oswald, Town Street and thereabouts, 1920 to 1950 by Ron Pearson. Before I was born, my parents lived in Burley Leeds, where they brought where they were brought up until they got married in 1920. After they were married, the first place they lived as newlyweds was on Westover Road, Bramley Leeds, 13. On a regular basis, my dad would refer to Bramley as being out in the country. He said that it was a village which was surrounded by open fields. The local rugby league team, the Bramley Rugby League team, were actually known as the Villagers. I presume that the Wyvern and Greenthorpe estates hadn't yet been built. I can definitely say that the Fairfield and Sanford estates weren't around in 1920. When the Fairfield estate was built, it was known as the Westfield estate before the Fairfield street signs were put up. To get a much bigger idea of how Green Bromley was back in the day, try and eliminate from your mind all the brick built semis, bungalows and detached houses in the village. Starting from the, the tram sheds and moving on to Stanley Road, the village at Bramley Station, Huff Lane. The globe was at the top end of Town Street and it signified the end of Bramley and there wasn't many houses on Broad Lane and near the, near the baths. I don't think that the Blairvilles were even built until the 1950s. Newley Lane was just a country lane with a small shop which was at the top. There were fields which were on the right that were known as the Buttercup and, Daisy, and the Daisy Fields. Our house was very small. We had a very, we had a very tiny garden with an outdoor lavatory. When the neighbours who lived in the house two doors down got a bathroom put in, other neighbours were invited to look at it, but no one was allowed to touch it or use it. Town Street There was a certain shop on Town Street that I thought was a sweet shop, but other people said it was a greengrocer's. The park was extended some years ago, but I remember when I was at school, the bit that was furthest away from the Westovers, was the hay field and we played there when the hay had been cut. There were a, was a police station towards the top end. To, there was a police station towards the top of Town Street and those kids called it the Bobby Hall. When I passed it with my mum, she would say to me, if you don't frame yourself, you'll end up in there living on bread and water for a week. Me being a cheeky kid, I'd say, go on then. I like bread and water. I would get a cuff around the ear and we'd both laugh. There was also a sweet shop and a tobacconist at the top. When you turned left, there was Broad Lane School, which has now been converted into flats. If you cross over the road, you will be at the Globe Pub. If you look at it from the outside, it doesn't look any different to how it looked in the 1930s. I have always associated the Globe Pub with Bramley Carnival. I remember the comic bands and how scared of them I was. My mum would insist on pushing us forward so that we could get a much better view. There used to be about half a dozen or more in the parade. For example, there was a Charlie Chaplin figure that had a chalk white face who was sweating like crazy through makeup which had been badly applied. He would walk in front of about 20 or 30 musicians. School days. When my older sister was five, she was enrolled at the school that had two names, Bramley National and St Peter's. Just like a lot of younger children, I wanted to go to school too. When I was three and a half years old, I was able to become a mixed infant in what was known as the baby's class. My sister was a very shy, conscientious and clever girl and she was always first or second in her class. However, we didn't have classes or forms, we had standards instead. One of my sister's main rivals was a girl whose dad owned a tailor's shop on Town Street. 
I was nothing like my sister because I was a dreamer. I remember one day Mr. H. B. Swickman was teaching geography to Standard 6. I was daydreaming a bit and I thought that if I half closed my eyes, I would imagine that his moustache was painted on. It just shows how silly we can get. When the headmaster's back was turned, I told a boy who was next to me and soon everyone in the class was squinting and giggling. The teacher turned round and picked on one lad with an infectious giggle and blurted out, Sir, Pearson says if you squint a bit, it looks as though your tash is painted on. Everyone, including the headmaster, was laughing uncontrollably. Entertainment, the cinemas. The Lido Cinema held 520 people and it had an upstairs and a downstairs. There were some shops by the side of the box office. I think there was a tobacconist and a sweet shop on the 5th of, on the 5th of May 1912 the licence was granted. Of course this was the silent era. In March 1961 the Lido closed down and the last film that was ever shown there was the nudist story. Before it closed down, the Lido showed such as Charlie Chan, the Jane's Family, the Rich Brothers, Abbott and Costello and horror films such as Bella Lugosi and Boris Harloff and of course there was the Westerns or Cowboys as we called them. Ken Maynard, Tom Mix, Tom Keane, Tom Tyler, Charles Starrer and Johnny Mac Brown were just a few of the stars who appeared at the Lido on a regular basis. The singing cowboys came along in the late 30s, mainly starring Gene Autry and Roy Rogers. During the summer of 1939, Gene Autry came on his horse and made their personal appearance in City Square. The City Square was absolutely jam-packed. My career in advertising had only just begun and I was an office boy at 10 bob a week, less insurance, etc. I was there because the offices were right next near the square. His horse was called Champion and he was the only horse that had his own TV series, which was called Champion the Wonder Horse. There was another regular who starred at the Lido, was... Larry Buster Crabb, who was the original Flash Garden, and he also starred in the Flash Garden serials and low budget westerns. One day on a Friday evening, Buster and the Posse only had one scene to go when the horse master turned up to take the horses to a night shoot for another film. Town Street again. During the 1930s and 1940s, the doorman who was also the fireman at the Lido was called Tunney. He was quite a fierce looking man and he looked like he had a broken nose. There was a rumour that said that he used to be an above, an above average boxer before he started working at the Lido. If he was ever on duty when a kid tried to sneak in without paying, he would give them a clip around the ear and then he'd say, next time it will be more than a clip, you little beggar. Most cinemas before the 1940s to 1918 war were only slash dash affairs. Disused buildings such as chapels, church halls, meeting rooms or anywhere where you could get a screen at one end and a projector at the other end, with seating in between, was used as a cinema. I think the Lido was one of the first purpose-built cinemas in the Leeds suburbs. During the early 1920s, my father was the pianist accompanying the silent films so that he could earn more money to save up and buy his own piano. Once he had enough money saved up, a boy called Ernest Broadbent, who was 12 years old, took his place. Ernest played Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, not perfect, in a talent contest at Bramley Maria and won. For someone so young, this was an incredible achievement. The Lido had to obtain a special license to allow Ernest to work there. 
He was a Lancastrian by birth, but he lived on Arna Ridge Road. Some time later, Ernest decided to transfer his attention to the cinema organ. Then, after his spell in Ilkley, he joined Gorman British. Uh, then, after the spell in Ilkley, he joined Gorman British and played at different venues in London. Then he moved on to the Regent Cinema and Ballroom, and then Brighton. In support of regional Dixon, Ernest to the Blackpool. To the Ernest, in support of regional Dixon, Ernest to the Blackpool Tire Company, along with performing at other Blackpool venues such as the Opera House and the Grand Theatre. He became the number one organist after Dixon died in the 1960s. He was a quiet, unassuming man who always remembered that it was my dad who set, set him off on the road of fame. He was a very prodigious recording artist whose LP can still be tracked down in specialist shops. Of concert parties, church and chapel entertainment, etc. In the Bramley Phillip Village and the other entertainments were all amateur presentations which were usually connected to chapels and churches. When I was a young boy I saw shows at Huffain, Zion, Ebenezer and the Tim Tabernacle. Pantomimes were hosted by the Bramley National School and at Bramley Baths. Up until the war there was musicals. Oh, at Bramley, and at Bramley Baths, up until the war, there was musicals. A lot of churches and chapels started the year with a pantomime. To avoid clashing, the dates for the pantomimes were staggered, and the last one would sometimes be as late as March. Quite a lot of the chapels, etc., presented a men's efforts and a ladies' effort, and also the Sunday presentation. Gang-based shows were presented by the Scouts. This was based on the famous one in London, but of course more simple. There was a time when Mariah had a, had a drama group, which I think was called the Thespians, and I can remember that after the bazaar there was one act place put on. I don't know if they ever graduated to full-length productions, there was always something going on in the village from September right through to April and everything was well supported. Once my father handed over to Ernest Broadbent at the Lido he had, he had every evening free. Both my parents were in a concert party before the war in the Burley district where they lived. Throughout the war my father was in Belgium and France and whilst he was there he helped to run a true cinema and concert party. This meant that he was able to restart his concert party work. This was based at Mariah Methodist, Methodist and it was called the Merians. However, they travelled to outposts of the British Empire like Osset, Sherburne and Elmy and Hipperholm. To take them and their costumes and properties, they would hire a couple of taxis, which I presume were paid for by the host venues. They had their cases strapped to the roof of the cabs and their trip to Osset, and on their trip to Osset, a strap broke. When that happened, I think they were still on Bramley Town Street. That day it was raining cats and dogs and blowing a gale. The staging of concert parties had to be quite a simple affair, which was usually played with a black curtain backdrop and simple lighting. Chairs and maybe a table for a family sketch would be used as the properties. Small items that could be packed into a suitcase would be used as hand properties. There wasn't any scenery. A black skull cap, a black neck ruffle, a loose fitting tunic, a black a black coloured black band, loose pantabon style trousers and black pumps is what your typical 
Her own costume would consist of the ladies' costume would always blend with the men's costumes. The costumes that were for the Medians were black and amber. Whether or not this was just coincidence or to match the rugby team, I'll never know. The one who made all of the costumes was my mother, but she wasn't very keen on the black and amber outfits. My father started a new group called the T Tatlers after the Merians broke up and my mother made the decision that the new outfits were going to be a bit more classier in jade green and black. For one short Chinese number she made a complete set of Kilmano style outfits. My mum was never far away from her sewing machine. At the very least, there was one occasion where there was a show on the bandstand on Bramley Park. The bandstand used to stand near the top of the park until it was replaced by the Coronation House. This was supposed to have been built by the Bramley Boy Builders. Back then, I had a cutting which was from the Yorkshire Evening Post that showed myself and a few others. Transport. In pre-1939 there wasn't very many families who had cars. I reckon there was one in a hundred, maybe less. As for motorbikes there was less as there were cars. There wasn't very many bicycles either. The men would use them so that they could get to work. There must have been about Half a, half a dozen boys at Bramley Nats with one, but not many girls. Besides the train, besides the train, the tram was the main source of transport. There were a few people who would trail over to Stanley Road from Time Street and beyond to catch a train. I could be wrong, but I don't think Time Street had buses before the war, but Stanley Road did. Besides, the bus fares were always a penny or so dearer than the tram, and every penny counted. The number 13 tram would always start at the Corn Exchange in Leeds, and it would stop at Branch Road in Armley, Bramley, Town End or Rodley. Rodley Terminus, which I think was known as Harrison's Corner, was at the far end of Rodley Town Street. There are some old photographs that clearly show some of it, not all, if not all, of, Bram, of the Bramley Town Street was a single track. It might have been a single track all the way to Rodley. If that was the case and you were waiting to catch, you were wanting to catch a tram to go into town and you saw one go the other way, you knew that you would be waiting for a long time. The trams that ran along Stanley Road were number 14s. They went to Branch Road, Bramley Town End, Half Mile Lane and Pudgy Cenotaph area. Looking back at the stretch that went from Rodley Town Street to Broad Lane and the stretch that went from Rickershaw Lane to Pudsey, the trams would have quite a climb. There was Jocular, the always but there was this jocular who always used to shout, Hold tight, fares ready, hold tight, fares ready please, and no five pound notes. The song Goodnight Sweetheart, Goodnight was quite a popular dance band number. One of the conductors always fancied himself as a budding Bing Crosby, and after helping an old lady onto the tram would sing, Hold tight, sweetheart, hold tight. Of course, the most popular form of transport was Shanks's pony. Everyone would do their shopping that way and that's also the way they'd go to the cinema and other entertainment throughout the village. The feast. Most places around the country have fairs, but here in Leeds and District it was feast. During the summertime there was feast in different places such as Armley, Bramley, Holbeck, Hunsley and Woodhouse Moor. 
Holbeck and Hunsley are both much bigger than Bramley and Putty, which are both around the same size as each other. However, Woodhouse is the biggest of all and is second in Yorkshire to the massive full fair. The Bramley feast was always held on the Barleymore rugby ground, but then it moved to the McLaren field, which was alongside the old ground. The McLaren field went on to become the rugby league ground. They are both now housing estates. I remember that there was a feast on Leeds and Bradford Road before the war. From what I remember it was the only one with a boxing booth. Despite how noisy, dusty and dry weather and boggy and wet weather feasts where people still went. There was quite a few big rides and I remember at least four which were the Dungeons, the Walters, the Dungeons, the Wal Walters, the Moon Rocket and the Caterpillar. There was lots of slot machine stalls such as Brandy Snap, Marshmallows, Toffee Apples and the racing type games. The best one of all was Chicken Joe. This was a circular stall with a large vertical roulette type wheel. It only cost about 3D to buy a ticket, but the one thing that got the crowds buying tickets was Joe's spiel. A large brown paper bag containing, containing one farm plump chicken, two pounds of potatoes, a box of stuffing, a packet of gravy mix and a lemon all, all for three pence a go. Whilst other stalls were quiet, Joe's stall was always busy. I could be wrong, but I don't remember Mr Joe having refrigerated equipment on his stall. Back then, no one knew about salmonella and such things. And of course, the old saying was, what you don't know won't harm you. There was this big hammer and you used to hit, you used it to hit a stud and it sent a rod up to hit a bell. I have to mention the side shows I can remember one I can remember once seeing a girl get into this tank that was full of water, drink a glass of milk and smoke a cigarette. I'll secretly tell you that I think it was a trick. There was this other time when me and one of my friends paid a few coppers to see a half man, half woman exhibit. I can tell you now it didn't go down well at home. There was also the coconut shies and rifle ranges. There was a shooting gallery that had lots of coloured ping pong balls that were on different sized jets of water. Then a drunk would come along and flail around with the gun. They'd fire one shot and all the balls would go down. Very slowly the drunk would say, Have I won a major prize? The stall holder would say, Have you Ellis like you shot wife on pumps? End of part one. Thanks for watching, guys. Love yous. Bye. Mm -hmm.